So we're back with brother and pastor Connolly Owens of uh, the Reformed Baptist Church. Um, we're going to continue discussing uh, the Dorian principle. Uh, the first part was more of a, a positive presentation of how Christians ought to give to ministers. Um, but what about the negative side? Um, one question I wanted to ask Brother Conley was, uh, what about Patreon Christians? You know, you know the, the, the website Patreon, right? Where basically they tip and give uh, from a link. And a lot of Christians use this, including myself. I have a Patreon. Uh, some Christians earn a ton of money from this. Uh, they're in full-time ministry, and then they accept all these donations, and then they can be a full-time uh they can just use that for all their lively expenses. Um, <laughs> what's your opinion on that? Is that uh, a violation or uh, is it okay with the Dorian principle? Yeah, so uh, the, I mean, there's several details we could talk about there, but the big one is I think that's a typical or not a typical, that is a, uh, that is generally a model of co-labor, right? You have uh, someone working on something saying, hey, if you'd like to partner with me, uh, please do so. I think that's uh, I think that's perfectly fine. Now, if someone has in Kickstarter or Patreon one of those uh, settings where if you give at this level, then you get these extra sessions of teaching, and or you know you get the uh, you get the backstage pass to uh. my ministry. That's now that would be violating the Dorian principle. Mm. Or uh, like you said about the the amount of money, I've noticed that a lot of Christians when I talk to them about this topic, they usually think that. Well, it's okay to accept money as long as it, you're not profiting, as long as you're not doing more than recouping costs, or as long as it's not egregious how much money you're getting, as long as you don't have a G6, mm. you know, and they have just some level in mind that's appropriate and some level that's not. Uh, certainly, some levels could give an appearance of sin, but that's never the concern that the Bible has. It's never too much money or too little money or anything like that. It all has to do with the, the nature of the money. So if if people want to honor a pastor much, I think that work deserves much, much honor. And if I were king, perhaps all the uh, all pastors would make double what they currently do. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's not a matter of uh, how much money. It's it's where it's coming from. Is it coming from co labor or coming from reciprocity? The yeah, categories yeah. that we talked about in the previous video. And if, now, uh, one I'm thing asking. that uh, people don't know about the previous video is that we tried recording the previous video once be before and failed due to uh technical errors so that one was a uh, was an attempt uh or a, a, a second recording of something that was a little um because we had done it once before it was a little uh pre-packaged but this one is going to be fresh and uh and uh exciting and who knows what's going to come next in this video <laughs> mm. <laughs> exactly um what 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 kind of issues do you think do you see in the reformed church um for example some anti-calvinists out there promote the idea that john MacArthur, for example is a living a lavish lifestyle that he preaches right. against prosperity and he's got a nice, lives very in nice prosperity house. himself yeah yes. like he's got a very <laughs> nice house allegedly and he's got a pool and all this like how would you address that yeah, well, uh, yeah, I've seen people point out to different things. He does have some uh, very nice watch, but it turns out that was a you know gift given to him. It's not that he's going out and making these luxury purchases to make himself look um, uh, so fashionable. And yeah, his house, you know, yes, it's it's expensive. All the property here is expensive. People don't understand that. You know, I have a I have a very small house that uh, where until recently, um, you know, my kids were all in one room and I have a lot of kids. <laughs> so uh, now that now they're split up into boys and girls and it's, it's tight space, but if you saw how much the this area, it's, it's very expensive. So it looks like um, living way beyond your means or something, but it's really not. And it's the same, it's similar for him down in Southern California. So yeah. I don't think that's an appropriate way of thinking about it. It's what, what we need to be thinking about, how is, how is the money made? And I would say, yes, there is a, a violation in that much of his money comes from the sale of teaching, right, from selling books. Mm. I, I don't know what percent of it is from books and what percent of it is from his church, but I imagine it's a significant percent from his 
from his book sales. And I'd love to see his church just get behind him and understand that's part of his ministry and support that rather than, uh, rather than leaving him to go pursue money through, through book sales. Mm. Yeah. And there's, yeah, there's always the context of um, property value as well. Uh, I think this house that I'm in right if, now, it, if you buy a house back in the sixties, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be had, worth a lot more now. He's had that house for a long time. Has he? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem it, like people claim it's a mansion, but I don't think it's a mansion. Like the, the, the house I'm in right now, we, my parents bought it for around 440, you know, thousand New Zealand dollars. And then now the market has just gone ridiculous in New Zealand. And then it's worth more than a million. And people think, oh, a million is so much money. Like what? It's like, we just, it, it depends what day and age you buy something. And again, it's, it's, it's all about the heart as well. Like if, uh, you could you could argue that sprawl lived sometimes quite uh <laughs> quite lavishly right you can argue, like you can argue some of these reformed preachers did but right uh you have to look like god sees the heart right god right. doesn't look at the external he looks at the heart and it always depends are these men doing it for the lord for the benefit of the kingdom and i think every every christian suffers from moments of selfishness moments of right. greed um but that right. that's no excuse for them part of the point of the book is that we have something objective to look at too and that's the that's the mechanism from where the money is coming from right and so both sprawl and MacArthur, i wouldn't you know i wouldn't balk at the amount of money they're making rather i would i would have some criticism about where that money came from right it came from much of it came from uh, the sale of teaching and it ought not to uh, could they have uh, made as much if they were going about it a different way? Possibly. And I'd be fine with that. It's, once again, nothing wrong with the amount. It's really about the mechanism. Yeah. And it's interesting that what you said reminds me, reminded me of uh, Ligonier Ministries. Um, I think a couple of years ago, I posted, I think, two or three lectures from, like I downloaded one of their videos and then I posted it on my YouTube channel and then I got flagged for breach of copyright and uh, i think i got a yeah I, I got a warning for it and i had to take the like i'd had to take it down and then i looked and then it was ligonier i think that reported me for that video so i, I posted a, a john gershner video or i posted a sprawl video and then i got flagged um yeah copy can you elaborate more on copyright and um what do you think is a better alternative as well like when it comes to book sales, what kind of model should Christians follow if they want to write a book to edify the church? Sure. Well, before the 1700s, there were, was no uh, modern copyright law. So authors were publishing just to publish. You know, it was the publisher who would make money from the sale, but not the, not the author. You know, they weren't getting any royalties or anything. Huh. Uh, so uh, occasionally, you know, they would put something in the, the beginning, you know, in honor of the society or something like that, to hope that maybe that society would, or the queen or something would, you know, give them uh, support the work that they're doing. Oh. But it, there was never any uh, guarantee of royalties or, or anything like that. So it, it's the, the let me, thinking about how to say this, the current problem that exists is really only about 300 years old and most exacerbated in the past 50 years with the advent of digital media. So there were plenty of models prior to all that that could be followed or today, um, you know, we have things like you mentioned Patreon or Kickstarter where ventures could be funded prior to the work being done. Mm. So the alternative would be like how exactly would like let, can you give an example of like a crack like a a practice that the church could do for the funding or the support of auth Christian authors, for example? Yeah, so if a church uh, pays their pastor well enough that uh, he doesn't feel like he needs to seek additional payment for this extra work that he's doing, uh, that would be 
that would be one simple way. If the church doesn't have enough money for that, they could partner with another church who understands the value of this person's work. If uh, they can't seem to find enough churches to do this, you can use things like Patreon and Kickstarter so that individuals can support it and so on. Mm. Oops. Very interesting because it's it's so it's so tough, right? The like copyright, like uh, I'm pretty terrible at copyright. Like, how does it work exactly? Of course, I live in these different sure. countries, but it's hard to choose a good model when it comes to anything, music, books, Christian, Christian uh, items, like, cause it's, you know, like we know Hillsong and all these, they, they get millions, right? Millions of dollars. And the question is, where does it go? Where, where does, where do these funds go to? Um, and the issue of copyright when it comes to the Bible itself, I've always had uh, concerns about that. Uh, you have my favorite translation, the NASB, uh, copyrighted, and it's like, there's something a little strange about this. Like, can I not just share the, the Bible? Like, the what is it 50 percent or more some it depends on each translation 25 percent, 50 percent. like will i be prosecuted if i do that like but the king james uh it was interesting you said the crown seems to have copyrighted the king james even though people think it's yeah. in public domain yeah there's an eternal copyright on the king james version of the bible that's not enforced outside of the uk but could be uh should they want to i you know, my, my statement has not been tested by courts, but, <laughs> but there are international treaties so that they would have some kind of grounds if they wanted to do that. Okay. So like, it's kind of a, a secret copyright that no one really enforces or knows about. <laughs> well, well, they do enforce it within the UK, but just not outside. Ah, okay. Uh, also the, the world English Bible, the W E B I believe has no copyright at all. There are some, correct. and right, yes, that one yes. is a very good literal translation. It is text, text. I always, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> the Textus Receptus. It's based on the Textus Receptus, but right, uh, like some, I've I've heard some reformed. I think some reformed rock groups. Uh, they 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 some of the scriptures that they use is from the W E B because it's oh, not copyright. Oh, <laughs> interesting. I hadn't heard that. Yeah, but I also hear some reformed rappers. They're quoting from the ESV in their uh, in their songs, and I assume I'm not sure what the process would have been. Um, they would have. I don't know if they got permission because it's only a small little section right. that they would be. Well, quoting. you're. Yeah, well, there's always fair use, right? You're allowed to quote things. People quote other people in books mm. all the time. Uh, the question is, how much can you include before it becomes? Uh, you know, not allowed anymore. And th there's no one rule for this. You know, basically, it's how upset are you? And are you willing to pay money to take it to court and see what the court thinks? Mm. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate, it has to be so ambiguous. But uh, that's the way it is for now, at least. So can you think of but uh, yeah, if I take it back to the big picture, you know, why, why does copyright matter here? Well, considering that model of reciprocity and co labor, even if it's not money, what someone is doing when they're enforcing the copyright on on some creative work that they've made uh, that they're uh, that is gospel ministry, right? Like if I write a book or I write a song for worship, right? And I'm enforcing the copyright. What I'm doing, even if I don't, even if I offer the thing so that you can use it freely, but then I say that you can't redistribute it or you can't modify it, I'm expecting some kind of license compliance in return. So even if I'm not requiring money there's still a reciprocity that occurs when someone enforces copyright. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's tough because it's all we've known um, since we were born, right? This copyright and right. Christian songs copyrighted. But I assume the hymns are not, the old style hymns are not copyrighted at all, are they? Well, it, that's an interesting question because usually you're looking at them in the hymnal and the hymnal is more recent, and the hymnal has made some creative choices where they've altered some of the, the arrangement of the, you know, the different melodies and things, or they've updated the words so that they've gotten rid of the these or thous, or they've uh, 
changed other words that they thought would fit better. And now suddenly you have a new copyrighted work and so they are oh, copyrighted. Okay. So it's not just a guarantee that this is an old song. Oh, this is Amazing Grace, therefore it's not copyrighted. It's, it's not such a guarantee. Wow. So they, they, can, they can take a hymn that's hundreds of years old, change a few words, maybe write a new chorus or something. And then the whole song that they make is copyrighted. So <laughs> it's a bit strange. Um, well, I, wanna, I wanted to ask you more about the, um, the burden of support. Um, it, was a, it was an interpretation that surprised me when Paul talks to the Corinthians and he, he speaks along the lines of, I did not want to burden you Corinthians. Um, I also assume that it, it's due to, you know, undo that he doesn't want to put undue hardships on others, but what's your view on that? Right. That he's not talking about hardship, but obligation. So, uh, especially, uh, so he uses the word burden several times and notions of burden. But if you look at uh, 2 Corinthians 11, where he says he doesn't burden anyone, uh, he also says in that same passage that he was willing to rob from the Macedonians, right, from the Philippians. Now, how does that make any sense? If the Corinthian church was actually, from every, all the evidence we have, they were richer than the Philippian church, why was Paul willing to, what he says, rob from them? Why was he willing to take from them, but not from the Corinthians? Mm -hmm. And he says it was, he says it so that he wouldn't be a burden. Well, it should be a burden if we think of burden as hardship more on the Philippians, but he's not talking about obligate, or he's not talking about hardship. He is talking about obligation, that he would not place a direct obligation on anyone, including the Philippians, because the Philippians are not paying him back as someone who gave them the gospel like the Corinthians are trying to do. Rather, they are co-laboring beside him. Mm. So I think that's a, a simple answer for this. Part of what the book is trying to do is point out there are all these hard questions and uh, paradoxes, paradoxes being just um, apparent contradictions, right, that that need a way to be resolved. And a lot of the attempts to resolve them have been very piecemeal or they only resolve some and not others and don't recognize that they, they don't have a full solution if they can't resolve all of them. And I believe this very simple uh, dichotomy between uh, reciprocity and co-labor uh, solves all the ones that, I've, that I bring up in the book anyway. I'm not sure if there are more I've missed. Mm. Yeah, and again, Christ came to bear our burdens and we are to follow and imitate Christ. And we also bear the burdens of others. And when it comes to giving, um, we, we take upon the burdens of others, of gospel ministers, of preachers, of pastors. We share in their suffering in a sense, because if they're struggling, we struggle with them by giving, by supporting them. And as an act of worship, of course, mediated by God himself. Uh, what are other issues you think the church struggle with when it comes to violating this principle of Dorian? Sure. Yeah, seminaries are another big one. Oh, right, yes. We talked about books. There's also seminaries. Uh, so you want uh, to be educated in the gospel so that you can give it to others better. And you go to the seminary and for some tuition fee, uh, you can then... Uh, be educated at that seminary. Now there are all kinds of programs to try to help with this and scholarships. And so those are attempts at mitigating the problem. But in the, at the end of the day, there's still a charging between the, the student and the teacher, right? Between the institution and the student. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, a, that's a problem. We should instead come up with ways where uh, those who want to see the seminary flourish are supporting the seminary and the students are having been selected are able to go there freely. Wow, that that would be that would be incredible for the church, of course. Uh, imagine the church truly supporting seminaries to train up men to become pastors, leaders, uh, missionaries, theologians, etc., teaching and edifying the church, and they're selected as they fit the criteria of an elder or a minister, and they get to go for free. And then they get to go in full-time ministry to supported by the church in a co-labor model rather than they go into debt first and then they <laughs> struggle 
and then they pay off their debt slowly from the church, like from donations from the church, technically. So it's quite complicated. Like, how do they end up paying their debts? Uh, it, yeah, that would be an incredible uh, switch for the in the world for the church itself. If right, and there yeah. are a lot of there are a lot of churches that help students uh, pay for this, but still, that's the the church then paying the seminary for this service that they receive from it. And you know, if if you're going to have all these churches paying the seminaries in the end anyway, why not just do it in a co-labor fashion rather than a reciprocal fashion? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> the money is all coming from the same place anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, so there are there are some seminaries that do this. Or, uh, they typically function online to minimize costs, but uh, there's the Log College and Seminary, which is the one I graduated from, uh, operates this way where it's free for students. And then also the Forge Theological Seminary, uh, they also operate this way. Wow. And, and now I have a feeling maybe the Lord wants you and I to start teaching people for free. <laughs> well, we, we do that a bit, don't we? Yeah, um, maybe we could, we could create an online seminary and create a course. That would, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much have done that with your YouTube channel, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, my, my YouTube channel, like, it, it's, it covers a bunch of random stuff, really. Um, like, sometimes I'm in the mood to address a certain thing, and then it comes to my mind, and then I just create the video, and then, but then there's no, there's not always a, what do you call it, a structure to it. Perhaps I could create a course a structured, uh, you know, flow of things where uh, someone who wants to be equipped in the faith, of course, I'm not even really equipped though. <laughs> I need to be, uh, I need to get, I need to do my own course, <laughs> but sure. not me, but someone, right? Someone could create an online course, even on YouTube and free of charge, which covers all the essentials of the Christian faith, doctrine, practice to make sure that ministers of the gospel are, qualified and equipped but it, it's also a matter of character as well like uh, do they meet the criteria of paul for the elder and yeah and there's you know there's a lot of things really like just this view of the dorian principle the how to support christian ministries uh a lot of uh, views doctrines theologies there's so much depth to it right there's the word of God is so deep, so wide, so beautiful. And every Christian needs to dig deep and swim in the ocean of God's treasure because it's an endless ocean, right? Like we could talk for hours and hours about Christian giving and receiving. We can also talk for hours and hours about baptism, the spiritual gifts, uh, even justification, you know, just basic truths of scripture that, go deep and deep and like when it comes to my youtube channel as well like i have a ginormous list of video ideas like <laughs> i have a huge list of, of videos i'm planning to make but then they're just sitting there on a list <laughs> but it's like i just keep piling on my eye like some sometimes during the day i'm just i just pile on an idea that comes to my head about a uh, video i should make and then it just stays on the list <laughs> for, for a long time but yeah, um, what are the what are the things would you want to discuss? Um, is my connection Sorry. okay? Is your connection? Yeah, uh, yeah. You first for a second, but I'm sure it's me, not you. Uh, sure. So we talked about books. We talked about seminaries. There's also conferences, right? A lot of times, oh, conferences yeah. are set up so that you know. In order to hear the gospel, you have to come uh, pay us to be a part of this conference. Now, you know, maybe that's a fee for the food. Maybe it's a fee for the facilities. But usually this isn't distinguished from the fee you're paying for the teaching. And so it seems pretty clear that you're paying for the teaching. Now, if it is for the food and the teaching, part of what the book is arguing is that anything that directly attends to gospel proclamation should also be offered freely. Um, you know, Paul didn't say as he came to the Thessalonians, oh, well, you know, as long as you feed me and pay for my ship ticket, you know, I'll, I'll teach you, right? He says, I wouldn't take their food. 
and Jesus, uh, when he's telling them, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons you receive without paying, give without pay, he doesn't say, well, you can charge for the miracles, but just don't charge for the gospel. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it would have been a problem if they had charged for healing and then, and then offered the gospel freely. So as we do things like, you know, startup conferences and things, and we're going to offer food, you know, maybe people would go elsewhere for food. But if we're going to offer food, I think we should find a way to do it uh, so that we're offering everything that attends the gospel freely. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's it's true. A lot of a lot of churches and ministries uh, just they're not generous enough. There needs to be a big spirit of generosity, and I hope that through these two videos, we've convicted someone out there. Uh, regarding uh, worshiping the Lord through the simple act of generosity. It is a beautiful thing to pour out part of yourself, right? It's not just about money. It's about worshiping the Lord, bringing glory to his name, increasing his kingdom, and also pouring out part of what you are, sharing it with another person as a co-labor and fellow worker of the gospel. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah, and I, I forget that as well. I, I forget that simple principle. And a lot of Christians out there do as well. Like, it's much more blessed to give than to receive. And we forget to be generous. We forget to care about the orphans, the widows, the destitutes uh, of society. And we focus on our comforts so quickly, so easily, right? Like, we spend money on nonsense things when people out there are starving. <laughs> Right. Um, okay. Well, I guess that's it for today. That's uh, again, Pastor Conley Owens of the uh, Silicon Valley Reformed Baptist Church. And uh, I really hope the Lord blesses you. It's been a wonderful discussion. I hope that people have been edified and challenged in these two parts and to go to the scriptures as well, uh, whichever issue, go to the scriptures in humility and submit to what the word of God is calling you to do. Amen. Yeah. Thanks for having me on your channel and uh, just a couple of links, right? The dorianprinciple.org. You can find the book in all kinds of different formats, Kindle, EPUB, PDF, uh, whatever you want. And if you're in the United States, uh, the publishers yet to figure out international shipping, but if you're in the United States, they will cover shipping on the paperback. So you can you can get one for free. Even the shipping uh, they will cover. Oh, wow. So yeah, his uh, your book is available for free online. So you're freely given the Dorian principle. And I, I definitely appreciate that. And I will uh, be meditating on your book as well. Thank you, brother. Sounds good. I'll see you later. <laughs> Take care.